Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. G'day, how are you? G'day sir, I'm wonderful. You good self? Yeah, there we go. Sorry there about that. There he is. Handsome bugger. How you doing my good man? Very nice. Nice to meet you. Are you a bit better? I am getting there, most definitely. I uh, ran the furthest I've ran in um, probably about seven or eight months today. So uh, my legs are much better. They're slowly getting there. Well, last time I, I talked to you, I thought you were bleeding profusely or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I was uh, getting some uh, blood in the hospital because a post-surgery on my leg, I developed oh. a clot. I developed a clot, unfortunately. Yeah. And um, Okay. Yeah, it was certainly causing me some aggravations, that's for sure. I'd um, had a clot in my leg long before, thromboflebitis style thing. And it's just a very, I don't know if you've ever had one, but um, horrible nag, ache, dull, blech, just one of those shit. Yeah, no, I haven't. Surgery. I know people that have had to to stop uh, co- any contact with mm. fighting stuff because yeah. it's too risky now if you've had one of those. Look, I bought this just for you. Did you? Wow. Yeah. Gucci. 30 pounds. <laughs> 30, 30 pounds. <laughs> Send me the invoice. If we ever make any money, I'll uh, I'll reimburse you. Uh, we probably should have spent a bit more, to be honest. But if it works, no. is it work? I don't even know where I'm meant to hold it. Do you bring it close? Um, or... So I always try and have this roughly around a fist away from my face. So um, it's designed that all of this external stuff here, um, all the outside of it, doesn't actually collect any sound. Okay. So it's just, it's just there for show. It's designed, similar to this one, to forgive uh, if you're if you're in a poor audio environment, it just captures what's coming straight at it. The downside right. to that is, if you ever do go, hey Pete, you know I've, I've had this really great. Then yeah, you, you I, I've listen. heard you talk about microphones on your podcast before. I don't want it to be boring, but I did invest in one. It's the best thing to do. I always say, yeah, it's, it's that combination between having something good to say and saying it well. We both sit somewhere on those spectrums, depending on the subject matter, the passion. Well, I, can't, I can't guarantee either of those things are going to happen, <laughs> but as long as you can hear me. You have automatically got one of those global things going for you, which you've got a good accent, so that helps significantly. Well, that's ironic, because I've just come back from Paris where that, that was not the feedback. <laughs> I do <did> not. <laughs> no, they said you could try a little vowel, few vowels and maybe moving your lips. Ah, fuck them. Don't worry about it. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. You have an accent, of course. I have an accent from somewhere. Mine's, mine's a bit of a, a bit of a mongrel, to be honest. It, uh, I tend to accidentally pick up little bits and bobs from all the different people that I speak to from around the world. I think it's a subconscious mirroring. New Zealand had a prime minister that used to do that, and it was very embarrassing on an international stage. I am very difficult to offend is one of the habits I've uh, developed over the time of doing things like podcasting. Just try and uh, try and avoid making it about yourself at all. It's all about do, the individual. Do you get? It? I was just interested on the, on the podcast world. It's a very crowded space, and you've got a very particular little niche there. So mm. I hope it's going well. Do Do you get um, unsolicited feedback, or do you solicit feedback from your audience? We do both, but we right. predominantly get unsolicited feedback because I'm terrible at soliciting it on a regular basis, and we get a lot of, lot of lovely messages. Um, so we've reached, we reach on average, well, we've reached about 390 something thousand people um, every sort of six months. But that average is out of something like 10 to 20,000 a month, depending on fluctuations. But every now and again, and I say every now and again on a daily basis, we will get messages from people all over the world, random. I had one from South Africa today I could send you a screenshot of. 
Um, that one was from a firefighter. Most are from firefighters, to be fair. But we get quite a few from paramedics. We get some school teachers. We just get some random members of the public quite a lot who just say, um, you know, my dad or my cousin or my ex-husband or my wife right. is a member of the emergency services. And I didn't really know anything about it. And I never really get an opportunity to hear from anybody working in that sector. Nobody really does what you're doing. So yeah, long ago, I decided to stay close-ish to this niche because you're right, the podcasting world is incredibly busy. It got enormously busier during COVID and you can try and please everybody and end up pleasing nobody. Do you know what I mean? If I just wanted to call it the Pete Wakefield podcast, yeah, yeah, there'd be a little bit of, well, who the fuck are you? Everyone thinks they're fucking interesting when they're really not as interesting as they probably think they are. But if you can make it about a sector which for me is the, the emergency services. And I've found those people fascinating. I've worked with them for nearly 20 years and there's some lovely characters in the sector. I did initially worry it was too much of a small niche, but now as I get further into it, I'm like, <laughs> it's actually huge. So um, it's such a rich little vein of stories engaged in really is. great things, lessons to learn. But out of all of that space, the blue light space and you know, you, you, mm. the firemen are the top one, and maybe nurses as well, but nobody doesn't love a fireman. Yes, you're right. right. I will you. challenge you and say firefighter. Just have that in your mind as we move sorry. forward. Sorry. Someone will call sorry, you a sexist pig. That. Bastard. I'll tell you <laughs> but, what that's uh... from. It's from Fireman Sam. And yeah. I did, did listen to your podcast about that, actually. Oh, um, yeah, we probably brought it up in a few different chats. Yeah, you had a big chat around it. Mm. Uh, with one particular lady. Yeah, I can't remember what name said, was. It is really annoying. But uh, I think I work with a lot of interesting people myself. You do. But m my daughter, the only thing, she's she's only five. As soon as I said I was talking to a firefighter, she was like, her eyes lit up. Dad, can you ask him, um, does he get nervous uh, going to a fire? Does he drive the truck? How high does he go on a ladder? <laughs> and that's romantically what I love about it as well. Because we speak to so many people and they forget almost why they joined the job or they think it's not as interesting as it used to be. And I'm like, nobody really talks about it. The problem is when so many people get into the sector, they can get a little bit um, disenchanted through some of the challenges and some of the things we see and some of the things we have to do that we forget how interesting it is to us and how interesting it can still be. It's not the most fascinating shit in the world. You know, I'd love to speak to surgeons and police officers and doctors and, and people like yourself, you know, people, coaches, and uh, these things fascinate me. But no one's talking about what we do, i.e. as firefighters, certainly from a UK, European perspective. There's a load of American firefighting podcasts, but they tend to only talk to other Americans and they tend to only talk about firefighting and branches and hoses and i'm like that's a bit boring as piss whereas i try and like i'm a secretly head over heels in love with the personal development sector so what i try yeah. and do is connect with people like yourself and fly you in under the veil of yeah you know emergency services whereas i'm like this is right. this is really for me it's about personal development the, the podcast is it's about speaking to fascinating people and everything that you do really has so much tremendous benefit well look i, I well i feel the same way about my sector, I think my sector is full of not many interesting people I would talk to. However, I do love talking to, and I do get to speak to surgeons and all sorts of people. But the, it's the ordinary people that, that tell you the most interesting stuff often. Mm. The good, and you are about self development and getting better. So th those people generally are always interested in finding out what mm. works in other sectors. One of our best days was having a little breakfast, and we had our client clients come in we had guys from the army we had guys from well oh, we had some not guys women men all sorts from forensic crime scene stuff oh um, yeah i'd love to speak to some of them you know this lady she was voted police woman of the year i think she did the Grenfell Tower. She did the Manchester bombings. She did um, hook me up, brother. Get London, me that London Bridge. She's gone back to New Zealand, but I'm sure she would talk to you. People uh, have got stories to tell. They're fascinating stories, and they're not fascinating yeah. to them usually because they were there. But they forget how, well, how incredible she was what they've interested done. Interested in what the army were doing, and then there was rugby coaches there, and there were business people there, and there was a director of British swimming was there. You know, so, and they're all got similar things that they're talking about, but just in different contexts. They're all really interested and curious. And so I know what you mean. Mm. But I, I imagine this is a very popular podcast. 
Well, I don't know. I th- I feel like it is, but it's also like like anything else in life. As I'm getting a little bit older, I realize that it's all about consistency. It's all mm. about keep showing up, keep showing up, fumbling. I always call it learning out loud because it's I'm fumbling my way through it. I try each episode to try and be a, get a better conversationalist. I have to temper my excitement. Otherwise, I can start interrupting people and start getting too excited. <laughs> um, but I try and get better at it every day. And I know that journey will never end. But the numbers, yeah, the numbers are, are predominantly out of your control. That's what I love most about it. You're speaking into the void. There's nothing you can really do about how many people. I mean, you could you could pay for promotion and that sort of stuff, but we don't do any of that. Everything yeah. we've achieved is no, it's just natural growth. We don't anything like that, and and that's why I've been doing it for two years, and we're just trying to get massive traction now. Really, is because you just got to keep showing up, keep showing up. Show that you can be part of somebody's schedule because podcasts is something people listen to on a weekly basis. You know, they'll have they'll have their thing that they go to some go some of it on a daily basis. But if you can be consistent, show up every week, put in the effort, you know, this far better than me, you know, it's the boring stuff and just try and be 1% better each time. For me, that's what it's all about. Right. Shall we kick it off? Sure. How am I pronouncing your name? Oh, it's Bede. Yeah, that's Bede. quite funny. I, mean, I was wondering whether to correct you or not, because it would have been quite a good joke for my friends. <laughs> Yeah, Bede. It's an English name. Is it now? Yeah, you know, Bede from Jarrow, St. Bede, the Venerable. I don't know all my saints, do I? I'm don't you. you know your saints? Well, there you no, go. No, he wrote the first history of England. Wow. Well, there you go. Or the ecclesiastical history. So yeah, it's, it's from the 12th century. You don't know your 12th century monks. It's okay. Yeah, well, I'll put it on the list. So it's, yeah. a growing, it's a growing list, I'll admit. Yeah. Bede, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, brother? Very good, Pete. Thank you for having me. Well, Thank you for making time, most and foremost, mate. I mean, uh, I was just speaking before we came on that this whole journey with the whole podcast thing is a very strange and surreal thing. But mostly for me, it's a selfish endeavor of trying to speak to interesting people with more than anything else, because I've developed so much from pe- from speaking to people just like yourself, you know, going down the mine of those personal development aspects. And uh, when I first learned about you know, red to blue gazing and some of the stuff we're going to speak about today it came from a from a trusted friend who's gone through a myriad of experiences in the emergency services and spoke very highly of it but when i was reading some of the documentation stuff what really screamed out for me and somewhere maybe i'd love for us to start is about this aspect of almost being able to think clearly under pressure um i know that's not the only thing that it's built around but that's to me speaks so much about individuals in the emergency services i know you speak work with the sports teams and everything like that but just give us a little whistle stop tour, elevator pitch of um, who you are and kind of where you come from, I suppose, to start with. Sure. Well, I can't guarantee that I'll be very interesting, but. Um... <laughs> I wanted to jump in and just speak to you about a real ugly truth that despite the fact we are trying so hard, we get way too many messages and emails about mental well being and mental health. And I recently came across something I think is going to be a real game changer. It's called Genesis. Now, this is really different because it's actually human-led mental and social well-being. It's not just an app somewhere that no one's ever going to use. They provide human-led, regular bite-sized approaches. I'm talking 15 minutes a time, using language in a structured learning approach to create safe spaces for teams to have these conversations. And they've got a whole bunch of free workshops coming up online. First one is the 23rd of February, and it's built around sleep and performance with Dr. Martin Jones as a human performance and sleep sleep specialist. You can find all this in the link to the podcast. Another thing I'd specifically say looking at is their 90-day program, which has been designed exclusively for well-being leaders in the police and fire and rescue sectors. It actually gives you some tangible tools to have these structured conversations so we can genuinely start to reduce burnout, absenteeism, and general poor mental health. It's not just a tick box, guys. So scroll down, have a look in the notes to this podcast. The first one is on the 23rd of February. I'm going to be there. And the reason I'm actually going to attend something like this versus other stuff is because it's human-led. It's actually going to be real people talking in a way that I can relate to and it's easy to implement with my team. So hopefully I'll see you there. We've certainly worked in a lot of interesting areas and we do have a perspective. I mean, I I work for a company called Gazing Performance. Um, We've now separated the business out into two different areas, really. And the red to blue that you're talking about is is sort of such a demand for it now. We're setting that up as a separate business so we can scale it and get it to more people because we we started out years ago as a training business and most of our work was in the corporate space. But even 20 years ago, the niche we were trying to, to sit in was around performance under pressure. Okay. That, that's a term that you hear all the time now. Mm. But 20 years ago, like early 2000s, late 90s even, it wasn't really a thing. 
Hmm. So that was our space. And yeah, thinking clearly is sort of at the heart of it. And, and you do you do say, yeah, it's relevant for when you think about firefighting. Well, uh, people think people, about pressure yeah. as, as it's a very wide spectrum, isn't it? It's a very personal thing. So it's one thing that will place somebody under perceived pressure. Someone, might, someone else might sail through. You know, we can think from the child attending their first, you know, class in a new school or going to their first sports club on the weekend. We can think of, you know, the parent going to an interview. We can think of the far end of the spectrum where we might have the professional athlete or we might have the firefighter, the police officer, the CEO going into a presentation. So that spectrum is a very challenging thing to try and serve. So when you started thinking about like people behaving under pressure, was there a, a trigger for you? Because I know from yourself, you, you know, your experience sort of coach and mentor, and you've worked both in business and in sports. So when you think about pressure, is it the same in, in every situation? Or have you found it to be a, a beast with many different sort of shades? Look, it's common across d- domains and we were not just in sport but you know across loads of different places with children adults businesses sports people nhs doctors nurses um in the army the works you know what what's consistent there is when we started it was about helping people perform better so we, we weren't in that sort of wellness space at all it was all mm. about you've got a job to do and and by the way some some people's starting point is i don't feel pressure you know, I just get on with it, and that's okay. Some athletes talk about. Do you that. think that's true, or do you think that's just they are they are so deep into their comfort zone that they don't experience it? Uh, well, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's a it's a it's an true unusual. is a harsh word. You know, it's not yeah, like it's we're a... accusing them of lying or anything like that. But there oh, is a strong I... connection, isn't there, between having some pressure because it's almost like that. Um, there's the old stimulation curve in sport, but also you see it just in personal stimulation, where yeah. like it hits that sweet spot, doesn't it? So there is a real connection between performance and pressure. It, well, absolutely. So they're just defining pressure as, you know, people having a meltdown or something. But mm. you, why would we start with performance? Is it always that well, you, if you want to get better, you're going to have to put yourself under pressure and you've only really got yourself to where you are by doing some work or, you know, putting yourself in a place where you had to change from what you used to be. So, mm. Pressure drives performance if you know if wait if you've got that intention to get better. Some people want to muddle along and that's okay, you know. But if you generally want to get better at something, it it comes with pressure, unfortunately. Mm. Where where it comes from, you know, there's lots of places. It could be a million different things for a million different individuals, but generally it's around expectations, you know, either from yourself or from other people. And when those go up. Uh, that creates pressure and some people run towards that and sometimes you know you you don't have the you not feel resourced to meet that expectation so you have a little bit of a wobble hmm. sometimes the expectations aren't clear and that's a different sort of pressure um another place that comes from is scrutiny you know are there a lot of people going to be looking at this or you know putting yourself under the microscope and then it's about the consequences. So that, those sort of three general areas. Say, so look, it's one of those things that often puts people under pressure. But if you if you think about leading a team, hmm. the way to get them better is to give them very clear expectation, scrutinise what they're doing in a helpful, and you know, put in place some consequences, good or bad. That will help drive them forward, pull them forward. That's your job. Your job, if you're managing, leading, whatever, is to put people under pressure to to develop and grow. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a threshold, though, so you, you, you've got to be careful about trying to wring more and more and more out of people. And that, that's what you see at the moment. There, there's some really unrealistic expectations on people. Um, and I say unrealistic because they, what hasn't happened is they haven't been resourced to to meet that higher level of expectation. Mm. That often happens in corporate world. You, know, you want to do a lot more next year, but we're not going to give you any more resources. I want to do more with the same or I want to do more with less. Yes which can often yeah. be a challenge, but is I, I part of me feels like all pressure is kind of self-imposed though. Um, because there's a quote I have on my wall and, and many of which I have on my wall, but it's like, I always say that all, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. And what I mean by that is pressure is something based on your perception in, in my history. You know, when I, when I hear people go, oh, I'm under a lot of pressure at work. I think you can you can you can sort of switch the things within that equation and look at it like the value of importance I place on my employment 
has allowed it um, to put me under pressure. Because ultimately, if I didn't care about it at all, I wouldn't feel under pressure. And there's, a, there's, there's again, uh, you know, without playing clever word games or something like that, we all value something. So pressure is inevitable. You will value the opinion of your partner. You value the, you know, staying staying employed, value, you know, progression or something like that. So pressure is always going to exist. But as it relates to performance, how do we know when we are applying too much pressure or how do we know when things have become unhealthy? Well, I guess from the response you get from it. So if you think about you know, the first thing, when 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 people are under pressure, they tend to lose a bit of perspective around their performance. So how you're doing, um, you know, most of us middle along and that's fine. But when pressure comes into play, you can start to think in extremes. Oh, that was a disaster or, or I was brilliant. You just sort of go zero or 100 on it. And it, it's never about that. And if you're trying to get better and you start with performance first, you're just trying to get a little bit better, um, that never ends. Now, when, when you then go, okay, what's the correlation between getting a little bit better and pressure or having a meltdown and pressure? Um, you know, it can drive you both ways. Pressure can drive you forward or it can melt you down. And what, what determines that, I guess, is how resourced you are for it or how much you want the thing that you're trying to achieve. So, you know, we, we would often work a lot at an elite end with people who are who are really driven to get better and that they've decided to do it and they want to do it and it is driven by them. But more often than not, we're coming into places that have been told to get better. You know, okay. and we're not very welcome at all. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you go into a, well, quotation marks, you know, sent in by some... Uh, somebody body. to work at yeah. a failing A and E department, for example. You mm-hmm. go into that space, and they've been told because of certain measures, you know, you're in this. Been we, we're going to come in, and Gage is going to help you. You're not very welcome. No. When you come in. They've had thousands of consultants come in, and you know that's not really the issue. So you, sometimes you go into places where that they're not really welcoming. Oh, let's treat pressure as a privilege. And it's actually pressure is a real problem and it's to do with resources and all sorts of stuff. Um, getting off topic there, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it can drive you forward, it can melt you down and that can be determined on the individual, sure. But I think to isolate uh, um, the individual from the environment that you're in is is a bit of a problem as well. Sorry, how do we look to develop this this like level of self awareness? Do you have to get it wrong before you get it right, so that you can think clearly when you start to feel that sense? Because some people will term it as anxiety, some will term it as um, tenseness, some will some will feel nervous. Ultimately, everything there is pointing to me towards the fact that some form of pressure is mounting in their head, and their ability to to think clearly and accurately is that sort of fog is starting to descend isn't it well you're starting to talk now about the, the role of mentality okay. in driving people forward and and, and there is the, you know that's a big part of it but it's not the only part of it and i think it depends who you're talking about if you're just talking about general population who just want to go to work and do do feel okay about it do a good job um or you're talking about people who are in extreme environments there's sort of a different difference to that but what, what's common, if you think about times when you've done really well mm-hmm. under pressure or times when you haven't done really well, mentality is a part of it. Mindset is one part of it. But skills are the other part. You know, Did you have the skills to be able to do that job or cope with that space? And you know, the third part of that, we talk about this little triangle, is structure. What's, what, and what processes are in place? What resources have you got? So we sort of start with this simple line, zero to 100. So where, where you think you're at at the moment, where do you want to get to? Or you know, you're trying to get a little bit better. Well, what will determine that is the quality of the structure, skill set and mindset that you've got in place. And sometimes people treat mindset in isolation. Okay. And that that's okay, but it just means that you, you're not integrating it into your systems, your processes and into your general skills. 
I can't even remember what your question was. I'm starting to ramble there. <laughs> no, there wasn't a question. Don't worry. It, for me, when you say about mindset, mindset is almost everything to me. But when I'm entering a situation, when, you know, when, for example, the bells go down and, uh, you know, I'm jumping on the truck with the crews or, you know, when a police officer gets the call and they're heading to a domestic property and there's violence ensuing or something's happening, how early into that level of self went? These, when we talk about this skill set or this mindset, is this something we should already have in our heads? Is this a system or a process that we can adopt? Or do you have to wait until you're in in the noise, you know, once you've jumped in the pool and you're drowning and then try and those. think about the skill set? Yeah, well, all of those things. But I don't think people academically think about it like that. Just get in, They just involve themselves in the job. When you review it, you go, well, did I do well or not? And did my mindset play a part in that or not? And sometimes it it's unhelpful and sometimes it's really helpful the the pressure you're describing is the default position people go to for army police nurses doctors fire but in the in those moments actually people tend to do pretty well you know, it's the boring bits back at base or you know at the station when your colleagues being a bit of a dick and you can have a little meltdown and you go home grumpy and all that sort of stuff that could be just as much pressure the barracks mentality is just mm-hmm. as much pressure and in, in those moments we really have to just connect then you don't sort of have the luxury all the time of having a little bit of a meltdown mm. you want to think that the training that's put in place is resourcing people on the front line to deal with those situations really well it's awful when it doesn't when you see that i don't think it's remotely uh, formally trained at all and uh, I'm sure hopefully someone will write in or tell me that that's not the case. But I, in my 17, 18 years or whatever, have never um, formally had anyone sit down and speak about the mindset of, even when we start doing things like incident command, I mean, just as a firefighter, this would be incredibly relevant, just as a, as a you know, first responder coming into their role, police, ambulance, whatever it might be. But then certainly as you get into a position mm. where the decisions you're making can have very real, tangible um, impact on somebody's livelihood, somebody's home, somebody's business, and even their life if they make it yeah. out of this situation in the next 20 minutes. And that is the time when fear, doubt, uncertainty, you know, people start to have distorted think to, um, um, thinking um, yeah. and almost lose lose rationale. They, 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 they think very disconnectedly. Yeah, it's easy to see and describe, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we term it rabbit in the headlights. Yeah. You know, somebody who is very intelligent, very yeah. knowledgeable on the in, on um, on in the office or yeah. in the watch room. But then when you put them in the incident ground, um, all that's changed is the situation. You know, I was a lifeguard before I um, joined yeah. the emergency services, and they always used to tell me oh, yeah. the only difference between you and the victim is the mindset that you enter the water. Because ultimately, you're just jumping in with the uh, you know with the uh, with the t-shirt and shorts on or something like that. Well, that's not true, like, though. Yeah, you can swim. They can't. That's not true, though, because you probably you can probably swim better. <laughs> yes, but you're both entering a very hostile, very dangerous environment, and you're gonna yeah, for physi- sure. You're yeah, gonna physically sure. engage yeah. with someone who is in yeah. distress, and uh, you you're yeah you like you say you're a confident swimmer on your own, but you're now about to introduce yeah. an unknown factor into that. Yeah. Yeah, you will have trained in those sort of situations. So even though it might not have been formally separated out, we're going to do mental train your mentality in this. It will have been happening sort of by default. But you're right, there's a real gap. Mm. I think it's being filled a lot now, and I I'm not a big fan of the way that it's often done because it's done in a way that's a too complicated to remember and use when you're in the heat of the moment, mm-hmm. or it's done in an unrealistic way, and it's it's done separately. I give you an example. I talked to I won't name the team. I probably will slip up and do that later, but um, <laughs> it's an international rugby team. Okay. So they're, they're all elite theory, theoretically. And you draw the line and you go, okay, is there a hundred? Where are we going to? What's the go? Okay. You want to do well in the world cup, blah, blah, blah. Where are you at? Fine. And you draw up a little equation, you know, whether it's structure, skill set, mindset, or you go in sport, people tend to think about it in terms of physical, technical, tactical, mental. And you go, you draw that and go, okay, what are you working on? What's good? Yep, radio. Which one of those is the most important? And they all say mentality. They, even if you go structure, skill set, mindset, and you ask a bunch of kids or teachers in the classroom, they all go, it's mindset's the most important. Hmm. And then you go, well, okay, that's great. 
um, how much time, how much time in this camp? I asked the rugby team, how much time do you spent on it? And they don't, they haven't done anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, they get into the gym and they, they spend all that time in the physicality, the technical, the tactical. But then they also say mentality is the most important thing. Now, mm -hmm. why, what's, so, which I said, that's fantastic because I've got a really good mindset. Can I play on Saturday? And they, for some reason, didn't, didn't want me in the team. So it's not the only thing, but when they say it's, everybody seems to acknowledge now that it's a really important part. And then the question becomes, okay, well, how, how do you train it? Because mm. you said that you didn't. And in fact, could call you out on, on the way you train because when you talked about training for the British Firefighter Challenge, is that mm -hmm. what it's called, the BFC? Yeah. You said that you spent all, like the, it made me think of this rugby team when you said it, because you said <laughs> There's a lot of blokes out there who spend time on working on the skills and the transition and this sort of stuff. I just go full out on my physical. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought, think well, there's a lot of marginal gains to be to be had by developing those skill sets as well, and yes. that's certainly um, done out of ignorance for me. But I well, just the guy, the guy that you started to carry on, but the guy that you said introduced us, he was he's older, mm. and he went into the British Firefighter Challenge, and he spent a lot of time training his mentality hmm. he's got a bulletproof mentality anyway though he's very much a hero of mine that that specific individual because you know everyone can be fit and healthy in their 20s it's kind of a trick it's not really you know it's not really anything to do with your mindset or anything like that you can just get away with being very physically fit yeah but i always think of it like a narrowing path as you go up a mountain as we get older yeah, yeah. just to go down this rabbit hole for a second it's like health and fitness is easier when you're younger because you don't have as much self-awareness. You can't cast your mind into the future or the past very well. You can only believe that what is here right now will last forever. So yeah. as you get older, everything gets a little bit harder. It's not impossible. Then the path just narrows, doesn't it? As you go up the mountain and the, the only thing that's going to keep you on that path isn't necessarily how fit you are or what your genetics are. It's your mindset because some of the fittest yeah. people in the world will will fall off that mountain. They'll crash and burn in a pile halfway up and we'll pass them every now and again because the, their mindset ultimately failed them or they yeah. failed it. Or, and that sounds a little bit horrible. You know, failed is a very um, no, no, it's strong fair word. It's the, but, um, I often think the best physical athletes in the world probably never make it onto the stage. You know, the strongest person in the world is probably in, yeah. a, in a South African farm somewhere just lifting tractors and no one will ever see him. You know, the, the person that sprints the fastest, runs the furthest is the best rugby player they just won't be in a situation where they get an opportunity to perform on that level. The people that we watch on TV every day, I always believe, are a result of mindset. That's what it really is. We look at them through a lens of physicality, but actually most could achieve, and I don't diminish that because I'm not as fit as them, but you know, we diminish the physic, we diminish the mindset just by looking at the physicality and going, oh, they've just got great genetics. Well, so are a yeah. lot of people, but it's the mindset, isn't it? Yeah, and you either select people who have a sort of natural tendency of that or you're or you believe that you can develop it and you have a responsibility to develop it. And the, the problem with the, that team, their coaching environment hasn't recognized, well, they've talked about it, but the way they then go to develop mentality is not, it's just either they're not doing it or they do it in a way that treats it like a problem. So okay. that this is what often happens. You go, okay, that it's all about mindset. So we're going to outsource that bit to the white coat brigade, we'll get a psychologist in. And if you've got a little problem, you go and see the psychologist. Oh, and that's changing now because they, you know, they're doing stuff in a more integrated way. Mm. And most teams do have psychologists in there, and it's part of the team. They do all that sort of good work, but it's often treated as a problem rather than something that's normal part of performance that you should develop as a skill. And and if you just leave it to learning by experience, you won't you can't fast track um, you know, your performance. Yeah, so there's no specificity within that because it's a, if you just apply that template again to fitness and just said, Oh well, hopefully you'll just keep doing movementy things and uh, you'll yeah. get progressively fitter. Well, probably not. You know, there needs to be some specificity, there needs to be progression, there needs to be, you know, almost a, a strategy behind what we're trying to do. Otherwise we're, you know, fishing in the dark. Well, do do you do you agree that? Well, you've already said it tends to get the least attention, mental training or mentality training or mindset mm. skills, whatever you call it. But it's the thing that varies the most. 
particularly it's the when thing that makes for great sure. emergency services operators as well it's not about yeah. their knowledge or their skill set because i can teach you no. both of those you know i mean well, i myself you know, in the trained department, i can teach you those things but yeah. a mindset i would always pick that a thousand times you know and that's what frustrates me so much when some people yeah. go oh so and so though she's a she's a teacher for five years she'll be a rubbish firefighter yeah. or you know that and i'm like you're missing it. You you you'd not even the skill set. I can literally yeah. teach you it in like four months. I can make you competent yeah. and functional. You yeah. know, but your mindset. Well, that's what people always you could say. Do thirty mindset years mindset, mindset, and it, it might never yeah. change. It might never change. Yeah, because you're so focused. Yeah, you, you hide behind your practical skill sets. And I love what you said there around sort of doing it from the start as well. You said how this uh, this mental side is getting more of a focus. I think of it the same with our mental health and our our sort of cognitive ability we only tend to address it in the emergency services or in or any, any sector really when it becomes a problem you say i'm struggling i'm struggling yes. with my mental health i'm struggling with yeah. pressure i'm struggling to cope but in yeah. many services certainly in emergency services you will have a fitness test to join well then why don't you have yeah. a psychological check-in do you know what i mean because also then it well, makes I'll, tell, I'll tell you why go on please well i have a perspective on it it's a it might not be true, but I, I think one of the reasons it's not it's not an accident. It's a flaw, and it's a, it's a, it's means it's deliberate. People, coaches in places don't go there because it's they consider it a specialist area because it's harder to define than a physical thing. Like yes. talk about getting fit. It's hard to put a so it's a bit more mysterious. Yeah, and then when it is described, it's often described in a difficult way. So people might start by talking about, you know, psychological terms. Your average firefighter, I, I don't know, I haven't worked with many. If I started off talking about some of those terms, they just they instantly put off. So you've got to find a way to engage people in this topic to, to make it a normal part. Do you, do you agree that mindset's part of what you do? Okay, then how are you going to practice it and get better at it? And that's the question. If you agree that it's important, then how are you going to do it? So let's not treat it like a problem. Let's just treat it like a skill. If it's a skill, that means you can practice it, train it, and describe it. But then some skills are taught in a really complicated way. You just mm -hmm. mentioned being a um, lifeguard. Mm -hmm. Think about how people learn to swim. What What's the first bit you teach when you teach a kid to swim? Throw them in the deep end. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, you can't. That's right. You can do that. But you yeah. tend to start not by oh, put your hand this way and your arms. Yeah. Well, when Teach them about, I taught my daughter about the mechanics of water and how we can push it and move it. And you know, we just stood in water right. and created waves towards each other so that she could understand that it was something that she could pull herself along in. It is something that if treated in a certain way you can you can exert you can impart energy into water and i think that very statement came from my background in, in pumping and, and hydro oh hydraulics and, uh, and kind of stuff like that. Is your body can impart energy into water it can propel you forwards and backwards so she couldn't sort of swim so she just stood there and i would make a wave of water and push it at her and it would obviously knock her backwards right um and i says the same concept is true so if you put both your hands in front of you and pull backwards really hard you will feel your feet, you know, start to slowly move forwards. Anyway, we'll, we'll go into a, but I always say to people like, this is what I'm on about mindset, because I'm like, if you can, t I, I think like, if you can understand teaching, you can teach, you can teach the basics of most things, because actually it's just taking the person from what they know to what they don't know. And you can do the first steps, one, yeah. two, three. I'm not going to teach her, I'm not going to teach her how to become Michael Phelps, but it's just about, for me, it's about understanding where that person is and and that's so what I love so much about the red to blue concept. It, it it has some great words and there's different templates I've got up in front of me now, like the the the, the red to blue mindset toolkit that I was looking at earlier. It really helps contextualize in more of a simplistic fashion because it's not too wordy. It's not otherwise I won't be able to understand it myself. But like it helps the person understand or put words to where they are now, so that they can almost articulate why they're why they're why they're in the red you know why they're struggling well you're what you're talking about now though will sound gobbledygook for people because you got he might do and i can do that sometimes i can get down well oh, i was hole. laughing because i was thinking your know, poor daughter she having any fun in the pool I, I most people to that question what's the what's the prime big thing that everything's built around in swimming 
you said movement through water, and you're probably right because you know more about it than me. But I, most normal people just say floating. You learn to float, and then you learn to move. Mm. And if you think about um, passing a ball or riding a bike, there's one big thing, balance, and then everything else comes from it. But you see dads and mums teaching their kids to, <laughs> to ride a bike, and there's too much information coming at them. And that's what happens when people go in. We're going to talk about mentality, and suddenly it becomes quite a complicated topic. So, so well, I think when get... we speak in yeah. these terms as well, people do like complexity. I see this, or I used to see this when I worked Somebody. in the fitness space. People liked to justify themselves by making the thing they're trying oh, to describe yeah. overly complex because yeah. they're worried. And this is what well, I love the about the details. Is that... important. It's the, the details are important, but you guys yeah. and girls seem to have a discipline of not over complicating things. Because otherwise, it just becomes something that's like, I always say it's like a warm bath. Like you hear some really articulate intellectual speak. It's a warm bath. Like you feel good when you leave the session, but you've not got anything to use. You feel like that was fascinating, but I've got nothing to use. Whereas when I look at this toolkit, I'm like, it's practical. You know, the, the can't control, can influence, can control well, that's how good. I move through them. Hey folks, just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being. Whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests, if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services, we get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one size fits all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me and I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming, absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving, or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. That's great feedback. Thank you, because that's our worst part of my job, to make it really accessible for people. Because mm. if it's important, you know, there's eight, there's eight I, I think, you know, we were, we've got a business, we've got to market it and so on, but who's our target audience? So there's 8 billion people who could do with getting help with mindset, yeah. not just being a problem. And it's not a thing like f fitness or yoga or whatever. It is everything all day, every day, every moment in your day is to, you know, whether you're thinking clearly or having a wee moment or meltdown, it's all the time. So it's really important and it applies to everybody. So the, if we can get it described in a way that's really accessible for people and I think also a acceptable, mm -hmm. um, you know, people buy into it. Because you go into a room like that rugby team or a classroom, there's 30% of people there normally who are really not <laughs> interested in this topic or a little bit resistant. And we've got to start with getting rid of that. So you, yeah. so the, what, the first thing we do is, and this isn't a good example of it on a podcast where we're rambling on, but we try and get out of the way of the topic as much as possible. So when when we started 20 years ago as a training business, you know, we had an academic, Dr. Kerry Evans, we had Renzi, who's a graphic designer and a martial artist, and we had some business people. But we started that business thinking, well, how are we going to do some training that actually works? Because most training doesn't. You know, in, in the corporate space, yeah. and this was a figure from IBM, 80% of training doesn't get used after the classroom. That's what I'm saying. That's the warm bath. It's the like, yeah. you come in and do a tap dance in front of me. And I go, oh, that was interesting, wasn't it? And this is where you, you see them on like development days or or leadership days or like um, com employee days where a speaker will come in. It's a mm. fascinating topic. But you're like, I don't well, know, a place probably you're it. never going to use it. Yeah. There's a place for it, but it won't work when you need it most, which is when you're under pressure. So yeah. that formed our product, if you like, which is everything, everything. The only thing that people live with is one page. So even if it's a really complicated topic like leadership or selling or large account management, whatever it is, 
everything was described on one page. And we've just spent 20 years getting those one, we call them maps, mm. uh, one page maps, just worked on it and refined. So it's accessible for people to understand it. But it's also not a, a guru type approach. It's not about me or Martin or Jenny, whoever's delivering it. It's just, here's a very neutral topic and you can engage in it. Um, and does it apply to you and your job? Which is why I can walk into a, a, a space that I'm not part of and be accepted, if you like, and the topic can be used and then they go off and use it because I'm not really part of it. It's just, it's just a thing that they can use. Mm. I think those one pages must have been a tremendous discipline because I struggle with uh, like with the podcast. I uh, I struggle with brevity um, because I tend to, as maybe obvious already, like I tend to try and explain things five times just because I'm so excited about it. Whereas actually, why use 27 words when six will do? And I'm really rubbish at that. We spoke before we came on about like iterative cycles of learning and personal development. I'm that part of my cycle has to keep, I keep running it because even as I listen to myself now, I'm like, you know, brevity, goddamn brevity is what I struggle with. Look, that's, that'll be your greatest strength. I guarantee it. You're just mm-hmm. saying that there's some downsides to it. There, and the answer to that, by the way, my view isn't a mentality thing. It might be a mentality. Thing. It's a structure thing. So you just go back to just structuring your main points before you mm-hmm. can get into the detail. When, when we tra- my, part of my job is to train others to train the red to blue concept to people, mm-hmm. and we drill them on having a skeleton before they do their delivery. So you've got all your slides, all your templates, all your topic, or whatever, but you've got to have a one page skeleton. Mm-hmm. To say that under pressure, you can zoom out and just zoom back into what, what you're talking about. So when we talk about these one pages, I wanted to have a you know a look or a, or, a, or a sort of gaze into them. But I also wanted to ask you something. It's probably not something I mentioned before we came on. But um, one of the documents has a really good step within it where it looks at different strategies about finding yourself in certain situations and how you might deal in those certain situations and it reminded me almost of the excel function of an if then do you know what i mean where it talks about if i find myself in these situations because when you do talk to people about pressure they could probably articulate three or four situations where they would feel pressure and like it's define how you feel it what are you feeling in your body where are you feeling it in your body what do you think is about to happen versus what actually happens? And then you have a number of different physical rituals or strategies, um, different different things that may be a bit wishy-washy to certain people because I know things like breathing and spatial awareness are some of those. But is that a tool you would you would find useful with with most teams, or do you think that's specific to to certain people that do, 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 do struggling with certain challenges? Oh, look, I think it's great. I just wouldn't start there. It's like your poor daughter learning to the movements of water. I'd probably just jump in, the, like you said first, jump in the deep end, have a bit of a splash around, see what happens. So what we, when we want to get going on training this skill, we want to make it really clear and simple. And mm. you start with what's the big idea. So that that that's where we start. We get people just to describe a bad day in the office, a bad day yeah. at the fire station, or a bad day on the you know in the army, or a bad day in the Mm-hmm. at school um and people can do that and it's or a bad day at work you know it's very easy to come with that list and then you sort of go well look these things happen um they're not going to go away there will be something about those things that's to do with structure some about skill some about mindset so all we're going to give you is a little tool that you can use when those things are happening mm-hmm. and it simply describes the you know the big thing which is where your attention goes your energy will follow and from there, you can draw out this two heads. You've either got your attention on task, you're engaged in it, you're doing it, or when you draw another little picture, which shows a little red head and it's busy inside, or you're diverted your attention somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Once you've sort of described this, and it's a picture that you draw for people, then you go, do you recognize those two heads? And you go, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, who goes in the red? Well, everybody. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty cool. It's just a little description. I'm either engaged or I'm not. No, everybody knows that already. That's not new. Mm. What what people want to know is, well, 
how do I move from the red to the blue when yeah. I'm under How quickly pressure? can I make that system of recognition and then, you know, getting that self-awareness to recognize it, but then yeah. also so we've, having we've strategies just, just, that you can implement to move you back into the blue yeah. and how quickly you can do that transition. Because like I hit that mental reset button, like, like I'm, you know, like I'm on cocaine or something. <laughs> I find myself regularly like just going backwards in my mind to a conversation earlier or jumping forward in the future to anticipating something that's coming up. And I think to myself, God, get, get back in the present. And, and I, t I try, I have certain things that I try and do. And I saw a series of the strategies as I was looking through the documents that we've, that we've shared with each other, but it's hard. It's hard to do. And like, I, I love what you said there that What's no this, one, this, you're never going to fix it. It's like you, these, you never, there's no, you're not going to become a monk where you never enter the red ever again. You know, everyone goes there. Everyone has good days and bad days, but everyone can improve. It's finding those trends and, and I suppose being excited about implementing these simplistic actions as and when you recognize it. But it's hard though. Well, it's a skill. Yeah. Some people are better at it than others, but everybody's got to practice it. Now, I wouldn't start by practicing all those different thing we'll just start with the basics of being clear about what the skill is because it's often then described as don't think about stuff you can't control just focus on what you can control so everybody knows yeah. That. yeah so it's all the controllables the redhead is when you are focused on stuff you can't control and you you're flipping out about what's happened or you're worrying about stuff that's coming up and it's not fair poor me screw you blah blah all that stuff and the, when you focus on stuff you can control, you, you burn it, you engage. Everybody knows that. Mm. And the middle circle is what you can influence and all that. And you get people to write that down. You draw three circles on a page and just from that bad day list, just put stuff in the red circle you can't control, put stuff in the blue circle. That's good. And then you sort of go, well, if you paid 100 bucks for the session, which they don't, but if they did, you'd be a bit <laughs> disappointed if that was the big revelation. Just focus on what you can't, you can control. Oh, yeah, a bit would they, though? I mean, they would probably initially. Yeah. But I remember hearing new. the story of, uh, you know, it was uh, a really big manufacturing uh, company. I think it was somewhere in America. And um, there was a very simplistic solution to why the whole factory had come to a halt, basically. And the guy said, you know, how much are you losing, you know, hour on hour? And it was millions. It was a very simplistic fix, but the value you attach to a simplistic process is a very oh, different absolutely. thing. Like if you can learn something very simplistic, but it's a huge game changer in your life, it, the, simplest, the simplicity of it frustrates you because you feel like how much you've struggled with it. It must be something really complex. And this has to be something that you're going to give me a eureka moment. Oh, no, I didn't say that. I just meant, it can't, it has to be a bit more of a description than just don't do that, do this. Okay. And that, you go into a, you go into the water stints and you pick up any book, XSA, Soldier, or whatever, and a lot of the chapters are just be a bit faster, or, you know, be a bit more resilient. It doesn't sort of describe what the skill is. And and what I think we've done quite well is be really clear. Look, the starting point is to recognize when you're going there. Okay. And that, that is different to don't go there because everybody will go there. Mm. So if you get better at recognizing that or, and just having a language, immediately after the first session, anyone's introduced to red to blue, immediately it's very hard not to think of the, that. Oh, I'm in the mm. red. Just have yeah. that language. So it just starts with recognizing when I'm having that moment and then you can get more technical about how well you do that. And then it's about movement. But there's an awful lot of work to do on getting better at letting stuff go. You know, yeah. that's the hard bit. And then then it's not about just, like you say, being a monk and having an empty head. It's literally about doing your functional job or whatever the task is you have to do. So the red side's quite interesting. People want to know, oh, how come I divert? But it's very connected to the blue head of what mm -hmm. you're doing. So doing the British Firefighter Challenge, I've never done it. Yeah, you can probably see because I'm on camera. I, I'd struggle to get up the stairs. Um, without you know what though? I don't think that. I think that is a is a great example there because I always say to people, somebody like me should never win something like that. I've got like five yeah. gold medals, or but because I'm like 18 stone, mate. You know, I always say that the fittest people that will win something like that should be around 13 stone. You know, they should be a lot lighter than me. They should be quick. They should be agile. And I think it's offensive that I've ever won any of it. 
And all of the success yeah. I can attribute that to is just mindset because I'm not the fittest. I'm not the fastest. I'm, yeah. I'm, it, I just, I'm just willing to, there's fitter people than me that just don't push their body quite as far, I think. But that comes at a cost. Yeah. You know, I've had pro tendons and, and yeah. all that sort of jazz. Yes, you actually have yeah. to do the thing as well, yeah. of course. But I hate myself enough that I do it every day. <laughs> so I'm working with Gary. We just did, you know, and you come back to, okay, we've got this concept now. I can recognize when I'm starting to divert. And that means that I might not follow my process. I might, you know, for years ago I ran a marathon and I stupidly had okay. trained for a certain time. And then when the marathon went, I started chasing this girl that was running in front of me and I thought, oh, I'll just run at her pace. And you blow up because I was diverted. I wasn't following, I didn't trust my process. Mm. It was very connected. So when when you're doing that, there's a risk you get diverted, something goes wrong, and I start to panic, and then I what you've done is connect back to your system, your process. I trust that because I've trained it, worked mm. hard. You're fit. I'll get yeah, through. Yeah, but um, you know, coming back to an emergency services analogy, you can recognise when you're starting to fall into the red, definitely. But yep. the problem is it, it, the 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 very dynamic situation, the very nature of the dynamic situations that we face, is that they are they escalate quickly. Do you know what I mean? We have to put yes. in play. We have to create structure out of chaos very quickly. Someone is yes. calling you because they're having the worst day of their life. They're trapped somewhere. Something mm -hmm. is getting worse. The water is rising. The fire is getting hotter. Whatever it might be. And as soon as you get there, it's not just the the sensory the sensory overload of what's happening. It's also then everyone compounding that by reporting to you what you can already see a lot of the time it's you know and then saying what should i do what should i do even if you're not just a firefighter but even if you're just a firefighter the members of the public are looking at you as the solution you might be going around the back and just doing a 360 and members of the public are telling you in pieces of information and you can very quickly become overwhelmed with that because you feel like this is too much for one person we've only got four people with us or we've only and that is where i think people can really struggle that's where mistakes get made that's where um, the skill set can become detached and you it's almost like it sits behind a glass screen. You can't access your skills very well because you've become overstimulated. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. That is why we have a very, 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 very simple redhead, bluehead. I'm in the red. Because in that moment, you can't do much more than that. Now, so once I've recognized that, I'm flapping. Now, I'll give you an example one of the, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying, um, one of the army regiments we worked with, the first one, was the uh, Gurkhas. Wow. Now, those soldiers are not the sort to say no or complain, right? Mm. It's not in their nature. But we're, by introducing red to blue in that common language, they were able to say to their commanding officer, sir, you're in the red, sir. So in that heat of the moment, the CO's flapping, the two I see could say, let's see you in the red. And that was a real common language. It didn't have judgment on it. It just was a fact. So it was Yeah, but the leader's got to be in a position to be able to accept that feedback. Well, you've because... introduced that common language. So Yeah, that would be tough had... for some people. Yeah, very. But, well, it is if he was saying, look, you're making a bad decision. It's just like, I think you're in the red, sir. So it was a quick way to reset, get back. What, what you will do is, you know, the skill there is to zoom out. And, you know, if, you know it's well described, isn't it? Decision making in the firefighter world and, you know, yeah. Dr. Um, Karen Hatton and uh, what she's done, all that. This is well described. This is the process that you follow. The pr problem, and the Army is a good example, they've got a contingency plan for everything. They literally carry it around in their pocket. The question is, are they executing that? From the red head or the blue head so you're going into those situations you've got a you've got a thing that you need to do and you know what you should do if this is burning or that's and this is what you do the, the bigger question the first question is am i in the red or the blue so just having that really simple head in in your head those little that little picture is a great way to help you reset hmm. it's, it's not the only thing you've got it you can then practice the process you can practice how I move and you can do all those other things that you you talked about before, you know, whatever little ritual you've got to chat, you know, might find that when you go into the red, you do it in a certain way. 
Mm. Uh, you talk differently or you your physicality changes, you hunch your shoulders or you, you go too fast. You know, all of that slow is smooth and all that sort of mm. stuff is about getting people back in the blue. And it's, it is really important for an individual, but it's it's really useful in teams where you are going into that sort of environment to have a common language for it because you've got a common language for everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, surgeons don't go past me the shiny, sharp thing. It's like scalpel, bang. So this is about having a common language for mentality. And when it's wobbling, you can reset pretty quickly. So how do people go or how should people go about creating safe i mean i had a guest recently who said to me um you know safe spaces are where teams grow which i always thought was a lovely thing to say i probably said that wrong he probably said it a little bit different but you have to have a very safe space to be able to introduce a language i think you do and please correct me if i'm wrong but in order to create a high performing culture where instant feedback can be given like that so that you can get back into your optimum level of stimulation you can recognize that you're in the redhead like I sort of said a minute ago, that can be very triggering for people. So is there any ways or is there any um, sort of inroads or strategies or approaches that you use or you've seen successfully utilized in the past that help people develop a safe space to have conversations like, I mean, ultimately, I suppose the, the presence of yourself or another member of your team being there is an indication that there is some receptiveness to what you're about to, to give them. Um, but you've said yourself, oh, yeah, like, it starts, certain starts places you go to, it's not very, uh, it's not very, some people might not be as accepting as others for it. Well, it has to start with, are you going to work on your mentality? So that's where you start. And if you are, then just having that common language from red to blue is, a, is one way to do it. There are other ways. It is automatically just gives you some comfort there. You feel a bit more in control and there's no judgment around it. It's normal. Everybody gets in the red. That's the first bit. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, and you yeah. might get in the red when you're back in the barracks, so or you might get in the red when you're high up a ladder, mm. or when you're getting unsolicited feedback down the radio from your CO who's turned <laughs> up late. You're the first on the scene, and you're making those decisions. And then yeah. the big cheese comes in on the big truck and says, have you done this and that? And you go, I haven't got time to do that now, but it's part of your job, so you have to. So mm. in those moments, you might start to get resentful. Well, actually, you you suppress it all and you carry on, you do your job. And then when you get home and your partner says, can you put out the bins? You go, what? And it all comes out. You know, it's all of that stuff. So just having a little, and it literally is a one page map that starts making it normal, safe. Oh, this is what I'm in the red. Let me reset. Hmm. My kids have it. Oh, but I love that. I saw, I was just going to say you have a, specific one developed for children do you, do you go into schools and deliver that the the, the kids map the one pager about yeah. moving our attention and some of the some of the think feel act um sides of red and blue and how they're articulated i thought was yeah. lovely that we that you have that and the characters are pretty cool as well for kids well definitely and they get it what what often gets taught in schools is mindfulness and all that sort of stuff which is great but it does it doesn't give you a sense of performance and movement so okay, I'm going to be mindful and calm, but how am I going to go and do my maths test? So the blue side is coming up with your strategies, your what-ifs for this question. So you're developing techniques to be more resilient. Mm. You're saying, okay, and if kids understand pressure. That's why the, my daughter's first question when I said I to a firefighter was ask him if he gets nervous when he goes to a fire. She's five years old. Mm. But, you know, they'll say to me, zoom out, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I need to zoom out. You're in the red, Dad. It's just a little common language. It's normal. It's not a good or bad. They think it's, you know. Yeah. Yes, of course we go into schools. And I think it's a really good time to start when when kids are seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, when mm-hmm. we first worked in the uh, elite sports space, it was better to sort of work with the 13, 14 year old academy athletes who are going to get into the national team because mm-hmm. it's, you know, you can start to develop that skill and normalize it then. So well, Brian I think Ashton these mindset sort of aspects as well are so valuable to to children because when I when you extrapolate that forward twenty years into those people as a I will say functioning adult or someone that's trying to function. I mean, we did um we did a podcast a little while ago um, that focused around mental health in the emergency services, but mm. they did have some statistics around just the working sector as a whole and the, the number. I'm going to get the number wrong, but it was in the billions 
of how you know they said stress and mental health are is the number one cost to the economy because it's mm. not people's illiteracy or and i'm not saying you know the whole curriculum's terrible or anything like that but you know we don't or it's great to see that people like yourself and, and, and gays in red to blue are invited into schools but we historically haven't focused on this we've focused on mathematics history and those things are important and all that sort of stuff but i always used to use pe and physical education as an example of a real mindset development because it does force teamwork character building understanding um your own abilities your ability to build rapport with other people the competitive aspect of life i always think there was so much more character built in physical education than there ever was in things like mathematics or literacy and stuff like that but we never formally that's had anything your filter like, isn't it that's yeah filter. we never had anything like mindset training yeah. but ultimately that's what's materialized to be the biggest cost to adults and that i know we're just looking from an economical perspective there when you look at the damage that's done within the family from someone struggling mm. with pressure and how they may lash out mm. verbally or even physically against partners, mm. children, whatever it might be, because they probably recognize they're in the red, but they have no... But they wanted that language for it. Yeah. No, yeah. And they, they don't. They, they could never think that no. there's a way Everybody... of getting out of it. They probably think that oh, this is just who I am. And if people if people mess with me, then they're gonna they're gonna get the horns, or you know that's just the way I behave, and people should recognize that. Yeah. But they don't recognize that actually they could, you know, build some 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 stepping stones yeah. to get them away from that. Well, well, it's both ends. You've got very alpha macho type responses. You've got very shy responses. So you you talk about sport being a great athlete, and it t- you know it teaches you that sort of stuff. That's true, but that is your sort of thing, isn't it? We, you know, yeah, we, that's true. I've got my own with- bias there. Yeah, we work with chess players, for example, one of the top chess coaches in the world. And it's the same thing, you know, being able to zoom out when you're under pressure, just sort of think ahead and calm down, you know, where you sit, where you stand, how you change, all that stuff. But very simply, it's red or blue. And why in the red or in the blue? It comes back to that. So mm. you're right. When I had my first child, that put pressure on the family unit. When you have two, oh my God, it's like a nuclear bomb compared to the first one so yeah it's normal me and my wife would like to have two children we have three at the moment so uh <laughs> if anybody knows if anybody it's normal you're right in, in a 22 year old we can drop him off tomorrow or any any time they wish <laughs> but anyway every, sorry. Every, everybody's interested in these elite sort of examples with the all blacks or the formula one drivers or whatever it is but that's like a quarter of a quarter percent of the population mm. which is why and you, you, you're right. The, the impact of people who don't think clearly and don't think about consequences and can't zoom out and can't control their um, responses to things that happen, you know, they haven't got a sort of a a, 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 a button to sort of just calm down a little bit. Um, the consequences of that can be appalling. appalling. Mm. Now, this and I think by solution. associating it with, with the quote-unquote elite, they unconsciously distance themselves from picking up these tools. It's like saying, oh, those those shovels and picks and you know and trowels are really good for builders, but I'm not a builder. I'm a bloody whatever. Yeah. I'm an accountant. So those, those tools will be no use to me. Um, yeah. And they almost associate it solely with elite environments. Whereas, yeah. like you say, these, these tools, everyone's got to mind. Everyone can simulate yeah. pressure and does experience pressure in their life. So these are not tools Ross, isolated to people no. in, in emergency services or in elite sports. I was with our marketing person today. She said, you you just annoy me because it's, who am I meant to market this to? Because it's applicable to everybody. Yeah. You're right, you know, it's an accountant or whoever, you know, it, people, but vulnerable people, you know, any, anybody who's experienced any pressure, we can all get better at how we respond to it. And having a very simple language which normalizes it, doesn't make it a problem. Just say, okay, well, we can work on getting better at that. Mm. So it's normal to feel under pressure. It's normal to sort of get stuck. But how do you zoom out and get movement again? You know, redhead, bluehead, it's just the language we use. It's, the, it's just cognitive psychology. It's, you know, it's the same as self one, self two. It's the same as uh, the chimp model. It's all of that stuff. It's just packaged in a way. It's a lot more... A, I think acceptable for people. It's not. Um, it's not going to. It's not about a guru coming in to teach you as a student. It's just a new, very neutral piece of paper. It's got a little mirror on it. You can look at it and go, "Where are you? Mm. Locate yourself." 
and what puts you there and can you get back in the blue a little bit quicker and what would you do how could you do it so it treats people like they know this stuff already here's just a little tool that can help you get better at it so it's okay. quite accessible and those alpha people who pretend they're not under pressure sort of melt away and say oh that could be quite useful for me and the shy people i worry about them people i worry about those when i do interviews yeah. for people entering the emergency services because when they say when i say you know oh how, how have you how do you deal with pressure or you know what would you like to if people oh, say yeah. i'd never struggle with pressure or i've never failed sometimes yeah. like that i'm like well that's fucking worrying because you will fail at some point and if you haven't had to you know, evolve your character through a failure or through pressure already, then you're quite unpredictable because you are going to experience it at some point in time, and likely in this job you will. So if you 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 might crumble, you know, I I almost want to heal that you've yeah you've you've been over. Well, they will be very the fragile. Yeah, 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 of course, 100%. So, of course they will. It's, but see, it's like the frog in a well doesn't know the ocean, right? So they've probably never been in an environment where they've a what coming back to that point around safety. Hmm. that's sort of your starting point make people feel safe where you can fail and it's not you know you think about red to blue on a scale rather than an either or and when teams are melting down you know that's when you can detect you know it becomes very narrow they're, they're defending the status quo so when a mistake is made you hide it you know <laughs> feedback is criticism or praise when you're trying to get better You've got a much broader view, you know, what we call blue head. It's broader. You're trying to get better. So feedback's welcome. Mistakes are expected because we're on the edge. So people who come and say, I never make mistakes, they've only ever operated probably in those sorts of environments. Mm. So, but, the, but it's just an, it's for me, that's just an indication that they're sort of in the red a little bit. It could be a response to just pressure themselves. That's how they cope with it themselves. But, pretending it's not happening now that's not a very yeah. useful way to do it so you just want to train people to do it in a different way yes absolutely certainly in our sector that that aspect of freeze or shutting down or yeah. limiting your cognitive exposure to something isn't going to be effective because you can't run away from what we're engaged in and it might be getting worse despite your best efforts people die in the emergency services every day both operational staff but certainly the communities that we serve you can do everything right and still lose yeah if but you frame absolutely. it as losing yeah you know what i mean I, i've had some very difficult customers in the army people you know who would joke well you did you did you know totally like very extreme responses but i was coming back to the lady i, I know who worked in this the forensic crime scene stuff mm. One one of the things she was saying is one of the challenges she's got to train her new people is that they can't expose them to certain things like they used to be able to. So it's sort of hard to develop the conditioning because yeah. you know you got you want to keep people safe, but at some point to get people better, you need to put them in places where they flap a little bit so they can learn from it. Yeah, you know, and if you chuck people in too soon without the the resources and skills they don't learn from it so no pain no gain type of stuff it's not just nonsense mm -hmm. but just one of the flaws in you know elite sports coaching is they think they've taken people to the level of pressure but they haven't really mm. so years ago people say oh you can't train penalties kickouts you just can't recreate that pressure that attitude's changed now people try and recreate it as much as possible mm. which is what you do in the fire service i'm sure i mean i've been down to the service college i do but so, again you're you're yeah. right i mean i work in our training department now yeah and uh there's there's been a pendulum swing there which i obviously my own bias i will try and recalibrate it to where i feel it should be but um i feel it went from high 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 pressure far too many mistakes and and sometimes an unhealthy environment of yeah screaming and shouting and trying to overwhelm people with pressure too soon before they really had a yeah. tangible hold on some of the skill sets that they needed to use to uh to you know whatever pitch ladders go into and you know breathing apparatus environment whatever it might be um water rescue and all those sorts of stuff they didn't have the skill set yet and you were trying to apply too much pressure mm. whereas the pendulum then swung to a very overly soft i would mm. i would say where everyone's on a first name basis we don't place you in mm. a position which is fine if you're going to be operating in an environment where 
that will always be the case. And we mm. did set a few people up for fail. We we sold them a vision of the emergency services that wasn't actually true. And I think there is a cohort of people out there operating currently, or some of many have left, that, did, that couldn't deal with it, couldn't deal with the way they would be spoke to by the public or the way they would be spoke to by an incident commander. It was yeah. too abrupt and assertive. Well, we've got to train. If you don't, if you're not training people for that sort of stuff, so I'll go to the some of the um, army training places and hmm. the environment. The reason people have their things ironed and buttons in the right place and no hands and pockets, all those sorts of things, those little things are really important to create that environment, that safety, those standards. Have we got the standards in place around the little things? Because if we don't, then the big things are going to be affected. That's it. It's well. the old irony, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah. yeah. That, that thing but, is irrelevant. You're right. It's actually irrelevant in isolation, but it's your behavior, yes. it's your character, it's your standards is what I'm judging. Not the yes. not that thing in isolation. I don't care whether no, you exactly. did or didn't you know, no. button up your shirt on that it's, point. It's, it's underneath your jumper and I can't see, but it's yeah. what you are doing. They always say it's the things you do when no one's watching, yes. isn't it? And that's about, yeah. you know, checking your breathing apparatus set before you hand it over to the next person. Yes. It's, you know. All of those things are so important. The rituals, all the unspoken stuff, that's your culture. That That's about creating a safe environment. So some of my background is in martial arts. So the, the dojo is a place where people ordinary people walk in off the street and five years later they're doing pretty extraordinary things and they're tested to become a black belt or whatever and it, yeah you know different styles do different things that was a sort of an old school um traditional style it has still has contact fighting and stuff like that but the rituals and all of that stuff around what happens in the dojo keep people safe so if people aren't doing the bowing and the the basic etiquette it's an indication that they're not going to be safe when it's pressure time. So all yeah. of those little things are really important, I think. Mm. We are we are wandering off topic. No, it's wonderful, mate. I think that's what makes it most interesting, to be honest. That's the natural aspect of podcasting that I, I personally find most interesting. And when I look at the research mm. and when I speak to people, it's that it's not corporate it's not formal and, that, and that's why sometimes i'm a little and it depends it changes depending on who i'm talking to but sometimes i'm a little bit fast and loose in my language because it should be natural you know if you mm. if you try and make it too polished it becomes yeah. you can't connect with it do you know what i mean and, and i know you'll know that far better than me from teaching the material that you you teach and teams that you speak with if it's too corporate it will yeah. seem sexy to the to the upper upper echelons of leadership, but they're not the ones that really need it because they're by nature of the fact that they are where they are usually suggests they've got a grasp of some form on their own mental disciplines and they were able to do something in a useful yeah. way to get where they are. It's the rest of the organisation who are flailing in the um, in the wash of um, of mental challenge and and you know their inability to deal with pressure very well. This is probably the one thing we haven't talked about is that idea of diverting people deliberately. So as we close, so help me understand when people have been listening to, to what we've been talking about today, how do people go about creating those kind of safe spaces to sort of practice some of these strategies, I suppose? Well, our perspective is through the red to blue model. So you give people common language and a common understanding. Look, mentality is about this. It's just a wee way to describe it. And we're going to practice it. And when people will go, okay, this is going to be our language for talking about mentality, mentality will pop up in all sorts of different areas. And if you're coaching or training people, you can go, I'm going to try and divert you today. Your job is to stay on task. So you can, you know, we have one coach who would um, try and trick a player and, you know, tell the player off for dropping passes all the time. And you'd watch the whole team sort of melt down and feel sorry for the player because it was the other bloke who was throwing terrible passes. They didn't know that the coach had asked him to do that. And mm -hmm. the coach would then stop and say, look, what are you doing? You're all, you're all off task. <laughs> and I've done this deliberately to try and track you. So it just gives a bit, and you can do that when I go in and do for you know different audiences. I won't teach red to blue from a flip chart or with slides. I'll just get them to do a little boxing routine or some groundwork, little wrestling routine or something. And you just say, look, it's about clarity. This is what I want you to do. And then you start diverting them. You know, you say, look, this is what you're allowed to do. And then you just give them a clip around the head or something and see what happens. You say, what, what are you doing? 
So you can sort of turn it into a physical thing and you just go, okay, this is what happened. How are you going to adapt? Hmm. So you start to sort of, you know, give a bit of context for performance pressure. And it's not all about just understanding how you're feeling. It's also about what you're doing. So there's, I, I, when I hear that, there's many ways I can think of distraction methods I've used with people before. And yeah. even when I just put it back into a sporting context, um, I remember uh, reading when you read uh, Tiger Woods' uh, autobiography, his dad used to, you know, brilliant smash bricks around while he was, uh, you know, on the drive, or he would yeah. throw balls against something, or he would bang pans together yeah. during his backswing. And uh, I've been in meetings um, before where someone was trying to do the pressure, and they were working with somebody, and the person would begin to clap or uh, or bang yeah. bang on something, or they would stand very close to the individual. This individual um, struggled with uh, speaking yeah. in public, and they would come and stand really close to them. Um, you know, really invading their personal space, um, and little strategies like that. Um, I'm not saying these are, you know, it's an exhaustive list, but um, well, the, you're right. Yeah, they won't work unless that person feels safe and understands why that's happening. Yes, yes, of course. So they, they don't just they do it spontaneously. They don't know what people. triggers somebody and then just go about yeah. trying to trigger them. Yeah, that's right. But when you've got a language red to blue, I'm trying. I'm going to try and put your red. You're going to try and stay on task. That makes it easier to do and a challenge and you know people understand it it's not no pain no. i remember joe lydon telling a story about when he used to be woken up in the middle of a rugby league england you know great britain rugby league training camp at 3 a.m to run around for five kilometers or something he said why the hell are we doing this looking back to create some resilience and team bonding but without any context people just thought oh, that's bloody ridiculous and it doesn't have to be like that anymore you go look we're trying to get better you're going to be under pressure. Thinking ahead to that moment, we've got to try and practice for that now. And that's quite hard to do when you talk to kids in the classroom. Look, you're not your exam isn't today, but I'm sure when you're on exam day or when you're a guitar recital at assembly isn't today, mm. but we can practice some little things mentally that are going to help you on that day. Mm. Um, that's the hard thing to, to try and convince people to do because most people don't invest time in doing that. I don't think well, also they think they're too cool for it sometimes they uh they, they can struggle yeah. with that aspect of yeah. it even though they recognize that or they, do or they don't know it. how to or yeah. they don't know how to and, and if it's too complicated or it's too silly so just making that fun and, and, and an enjoyable thing to do and a normal thing to do why would we not normalize mental skills training and not always be a health problem mm. sometimes it is obviously and it needs yeah. specialist help and i would never you know dr- encroach on to that space no but i think people use that as an excuse not to focus on it because they use the very small percentage of people that probably do need medication or professional help and they ignore the low-hanging fruit which i would argue is the vast majority of the population that would actually just benefit tremendously from recognizing themselves in that moment of redhead and uh, and practicing yeah. some strategies to move away from it. Even just from like we said before about a case of parenting, it's so easy to enter into that. And I have it. I have it on the daily. Yeah. You know where I see myself entering that red space. Yes. And my, my my children aren't doing it out of malice. You know they're they're being. No, no, no We all get triggered time. by that. Yeah. But, but so. and then it's about how do you practice it, and that needs to be very coherent because it can get complicated too quickly. So some of those models I talked about, which are really good pretty quickly it's really complicated stuff so we, we've just got some simple things like do your what ifs tool you know prepare for it do your control circles tool start to work on your own recognition have some rituals you know mm. and there's loads of examples you can go and listen to all the all blacks talking about how they used it mm. um and they, you know they did pretty well um but you know just as much you can go on our instagram and listen to some young 13 14 year old kids or Adriano, who's up a mountain now trying to you know, do all the 14 peaks, and she's literally yes. in those moments practicing. I saw her, so actually, yeah. There's loads of cool examples from really ordinary people in some really unusual spaces. And like you said, you like to look out and learn from others. Well, they've all got mm. their common language, and yeah. this is how I go from red to blue. It's quite cool. Yeah. I think getting outside of that silo thinking has been the biggest thing, um, the biggest development tool for me. Um, yeah. and I think in, in, in most sectors that's that's going to be a real game changer for people um, yeah. 
Dude, I've absolutely loved that. Thank you for your openness and humility and being able to go down these different rabbit holes for me. I'm sure at times you probably heard me talking and thought, where the bloody hell is he going with this crap? So um, I appreciate you sticking with me and I appreciate your patience and I appreciate you know helping me sort of navigate through some of that fog. If people want to learn a little bit more about this, we are going to put a link um, into the notes of the podcast. But verbally, is there any way or any direction that you would prefer people to make contact with yourself and or the company what's the best place to uh, to sort of reach out oh you can just go on you can go on the website and if you want to get accredited certified to go and teach red to blue in your school or your club or your fire station come and get done it's, it's not costly and so this it, is something that we can train to... people inside organizations so that they can it's not something like an endless thing they're going to have to pay yeah. for it's something they can train up no. and upskill one of their individuals which obviously cool. without putting my corporate head on will take a lot of their poxes in terms of investing in their own people that person's personal development but also the collective benefit they could have yeah. by this person coaching coaching different individuals across different stations or sectors or yeah we've got ex-fire chiefs who are retired now come and they're certified and ready to blue they can go and coach people we've got ex-firemen who are doing it and i know this is going to be a bit american but i you know to any firefighters who are listening thank you very much for what you do and yeah bead thank you much my friend take care of yourself i'll speak to you soon all right thanks peter keep in touch firefighters podcast is put together to develop inspire and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family it's brought to you by myself operational firefighter pete wakefield if you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue please head over to our patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast please hit that follow subscribe or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening